بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق محمد ابن عبد الله خاتم النبيين الله سبحانه وتعالى أرسله رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه وعلى من سار على دربهم واتبع نهجهم إلى يوم الدين All praises due to Allah, the beneficent, most gracious, most merciful, we praise Him. We seek His help and we seek His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and the evil of our actions. Whomever Allah guides, none can misguide. And whomever Allah leads astray, none can guide. I bear witness that there is no God or deity worthy of worship, but one God, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his slave and messenger. As I bear witness that Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and Muhammad, they are brethren in Islam. As our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Al-Anbiya ukhwa wa deenuhum wahid. That the Prophets are brethren and their religion is one. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I welcome you all, our special guests, the non-Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to the truth. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we'd walk into paradise hand by hand. Yusuf Istaz is late again, so obviously first of all we need to realize his age and he has problems, he needs to go to the toilets every now and then. So for that reason, I intend to tell you about a special man in my life. This man is my grandfather. This man, he was living in an area called Zgarta in Lebanon. And he's from a family that is very religious. They're Maronite Christians. And they used to have this culture and custom that they used to teach the children from a young age a certain trade. So they've sent him to a Muslim who is professional in tailing, tailing clothing. And subhanAllah, this Muslim man, he'd always pounce upon opportunities with his character, his behavior, and he'd be talking to Muslims and non-Muslims about Islam. Because the Muslims there themselves are in desperate need to know Islam. The majority of Muslims there themselves don't know Islam. And this is something that we need to acknowledge. So at an age of 12, subhanAllah, my grandfather at that age, he started to listen and look at this great example, this tailor. At an age of 13, he embraced Islam. And they were very rich, and he used to go to the church and chant inside the church. So his parents found out at an age of 13, but they said he's young, he'll get over it. At an age of 15, he showed steadfastness. He was firm, as we Muslims should be. So they brought him forward amongst the family, and they said to him, listen, you have two choices. You either leave Islam or leave the house. That's the ultimatum. That's what you have. These are the only two choices that you have in front of you. What do you want? He said, I'm willing to leave the house. He left Lebanon at an age of 15 years old. My young brothers and sisters in Islam listen to this amazing story. And that's how Muslims should be. Do people think that they will say that we believe and they will not be facing any trials or confrontations? At an age of 15, he left Lebanon and he went to Brazil. He stayed there for 10 years. He worked, saved some money and came back to Lebanon. He went into a partnership with a Muslim man. This Muslim man, within six months, ripped him off. Everything that he saved in a 10-year period, subhanAllah al-Azim, it was gone. His parents found out. And as I said, they were very wealthy. They were, their surname was Zablit. Alhamdulillah that he changed his name to Muhtadi. <laughs> so what happened? His parents found out. They came down, they came to uh, Tripoli where he was. And they said to him that, we've heard that you've lost everything. He said, who told you this? He said, I'm a multi-millionaire. They said, what do you mean? We've just been told by your friends that you've lost everything. Everything that you saved in Brazil has gone. And this Muslim man ripped you off. 
unfortunately, some Muslims who don't understand Islam, they think cheating is permissible. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Man ghasha falaysa minna. Whomever cheats, he is not of us. Whomever cheats, Muslims, Jews, Christian, Buddhists, why do you think Islam is spread all over the world at the moment? And the biggest Islamic country, which is Indonesia, they've embraced Islam through the trade and the character and the honesty and the trust of Muslims. Subhanallah al-Azim. They said to him, we're willing to compensate you on the condition that you leave Islam. He said, I'm a multi-millionaire. They said, what do you mean? He said, I still have Islam. If you want to be rich, if you want to be wealthy, if you want to be content, it is by you obeying your creator. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through trials and afflictions, my dear brothers and sisters. And that is life. That's life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Al-Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Those who indeed say that our Lord is Allah, and then they are steadfast. They're not shaky. They're not those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in Al-Quran. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى حَرْفِ and there are some people that worship Allah on an edge. When good happens, they are grateful. But when a calamity befalls upon them, they fall back on, this, on their face. They've lost this worldly life in the hereafter. Listen to this amazing verse in the Quran. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَارُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ Indeed, those who say that our Lord is Allah. ثُمَّ استقام. And then they are steadfast. If someone comes to you, my dear sister, and st starts to make fun of your hijab, be steadfast. Say, I am the follower of Mary. I'm a Muslim. My creator, the most gracious, most merciful, has commanded me to put the hijab. Because women to us like a diamond. You'll never want to uncover a diamond, would you? And if someone comes to laugh at you, my dear brother, who you've got the beard and you follow or you want to follow Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. Let them laugh. You'll follow in their footsteps. Subhanallah, to confirm what I've just said, once I was on Footscray, I just came out of a clinic. I was walking around the corner and a young boy was running and he looked at me like this and he ran back and he said, Mom, Mom, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Subhanallah, natural. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Al-Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ Indeed, those who say that our Lord is Allah. And then they're steadfast. They're not shaky. They're not part-time Muslims. They're not Muslims only in Ramadan or during Hajj. They're always Muslims. They're Muslim with their wives. They treat them well. They give them respect. There's mutual respect. They're, they're obviously Muslim when they are dealing with non-Muslim. They show them Islam through their behavior and their character. They're Muslims with their children. They are a role model. They give them their rights. They're Muslims with non-Muslims. -non as I said, to be a great example, not to steal, not to cheat, not to abuse. This is Islam. Islam is not just praying, fasting, performing pilgrimage. No, it's, Islam is greater than this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Al-Quran, وَعَبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Worship your Lord until certainty comes to you. What is certainty? Death. Because people have differences of opinion about Jesus, about Moses, about Muhammad. But there's one... There's something that we all have consensus upon, which is death. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called yaqeen death. Wa'abud rabbaka hatta ya'tiyaka al-yaqeen. Worship your Lord until death, certainty comes to you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Inna al-lazina qalu rabbuna Allah. Indeed, those who say that our Lord is Allah. Thumma istaqamu. And then they are steadfast. Tatanazzalu alayhimu al-malaika. Angels descend upon them while they are dying. And they would say to them, Allah takhafu wa la tahzanu wa abshiru bil jannah. Fee not. No worry. And glad tidings that you, destiny is paradise. Look at the beautiful, subhanallah. Look at the amazing status that you'll be at at a time when people are crying around you and the angels are addressing you. And alhamdulillah, my grandfather has changed his name, as I said, from Zablit to Muhtadi. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every good deed that I do, it will be in the scale of good deeds for him, the Day of Judgment. May Allah protect you and preserve you all. Without any further delay, Yusuf Istaz is here. Jazakumullah khairah. Thank you very much for being great listeners.
Bismillah, elhamdülillah, ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulullah. Eşhedü ve la ilahe illallah, ve eşhedü min Muhammedin abdehu rasul. Ve selamu aleyküm. It's good to be here with all of you again tonight. Some of you didn't stay all night, did you? Just camp out? MashaAllah. I like that. I was listening to the program from back there. And I was thinking about what happens when people who are not Muslim hear about Islam in the media, websites, even, you know, from some people who said they had contacts with some Muslims. And I was remembering what happened when I first had the chance to meet a Muslim. How many of you heard about the story? <laughs> you already heard it? I'm not going to bother you with it again. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Do we have anybody here tonight that's a Muslim? Where are the Muslims at? Where are they? If the angels came right now and wanted to know who's the Muslims, who'd raise their hand? Let's see. Huh? Hello. Okay. Do we have anybody here that's not a Muslim yet? <laughs> You already got the beard, man. I said, you're good to go. <laughs> How about over here? Huh? Give it. <laughs> Close. And when people hear the story of what some Muslims do, and then this, of course, has to be exaggerated a little bit, then we find some you know, pretty rotten stories that come around. And just the other day, right here in Australia, there was a chance for me to interview some people. I like to do that man on the street thing with the camera and go around and ask the people, well, have you heard about Islam? What do you know about Muslims? Have you ever seen any of those programs where they do that? And you listen to people's responses. Some of them are hysterical. And some of them you'd be surprised that, it, that a person, not Muslim, will say, oh, Islam, well, Islam you have to do uh, something called shahada. Then they have to do prayer five times a day. And they go down the list and you're like, whoa, all right. And then others will say, Islam. I remember one time I asked somebody, I said, uh, have you heard of Islam? He's thinking, thinking. I said, you know, Islam. He said, is that a salad dressing? <laughs> I'm like, what? But, you know, so you have everything in between. But then there are those that have a really bad notion about Islam and it's fair because if that's all they know, that's all they know. But it should be that after somebody is dealing with Muslims, even for a short period of time, that they'd have a pretty good impression of Islam and what the Muslims are about. But as we just heard a few minutes ago, sometimes some of the Muslims are pretty tough and not so good. And then that leaves a bad impression for all the rest of us. We do have, according to the Catholic Church's latest release, for whatever that's worth, we do have the distinction now of being the largest religion in the world. That's according to the Catholic Church. Islam is to them the largest of all the religions on earth. We passed them up, they said, in the last census. You don't look excited. <laughs> It doesn't really matter, does it? Does it? If we have one more or one less Muslim out of one and a half or two billion people, I can't tell the difference. You can't tell the difference. But it makes a lot of difference how the Muslims we have behave. The akhlaq of the Muslim is really what it's all about. The behavior, 
the manners, the way of the Muslim. When we talk about the people of the West, so-called West, and the so-called East, so-called Middle East, there will always be cultural difference, and there's going to be traditions that some tribes and people have that will separate them from the other people. But when we start talking about religion, most religions have something that are that kind of leans toward their own area. For instance, Hindus obviously are going to be basically from India. Why? Well, that's really the name. It's not really India. It's Hindustan, and their religion's named after the place. That's Hinduism. Christianity is not exactly the same way, though, because it does have adherents from all of the population of the world. Judaism, on the other hand, is pretty strict. If you want to be a real Jew, you have to be born under the tribe of Judah. So the only way you can really join is get a blood transfusion from somebody that's from there, if you want to go by that. And then Buddhism is just limited really to uh, certain areas. Some people are attracted to it, but what about Islam? Islam claims to be for all places and all people and all times. This is the claim in Islam. Because I grew up with a Christian background, I can speak from that to the extent, at least for the first 50 years, and tell you that I definitely saw, whether they will ever admit it or not, prejudice. Because even today, we have Christian churches that are for Chinese, and Christian churches for Japanese, and we have Christian churches for black people, Christian churches for Mexican people, even though they speak English. But wouldn't it be strange to you and I if somebody said, oh, don't go to that mosque over there because that's black people? Because any masjid in the world could have a black person as the imam or a white person or a yellow person or any color person and we wouldn't think about it, would we? <laughs> All we want to know is can he recite the Quran correctly? That would be the main thing. When Malcolm X was re close to real Islam, you know he used to be in the nation of Islam, but when he came to real Islam, that was one of the things that struck him because he had gone for Hajj. And he was amazed. He said, you'd be praying right next to a white person. And uh, blacks and browns and all the colors, and all, you know, all together. He was amazed. He talked about it. One of the things he said was that when he did Salah in some small masjid, in, in Mecca, they weren't actually at the big haram, they were in a small masjid, he said that he noticed that the one leading was probably from Africa, but he was black, and so he went to him after the prayer and he said, did you ever think you'd have a chance to be leading prayer in front of all these white guys? He said, the man looked at him and said, what? What are you talking about? Because of the stigma, the thing that he grew up in, in his mentality, this was a big deal. You know? To try to finally get a chance to be up at level with Whitey. That's what he talked about. And I watched... The, uh, by the way, I used to be white. And... <laughs> <laughs> I tried to keep a straight face I couldn't <laughs> but I used to watch when I was real little I, I watched my cousins you know and they were telling me something one time about coloreds and I, and I was thinking color you know color 
at that time was a big deal because movies were black and white. What television there was, and there weren't that many TVs around, they were all black and white, but there was something new out called Technicolor. This is a big deal. Tadeo, Technicolor, and there was something called Buena Vista, which is a part of Disney for the animal things, kind of like the, the early version of Animal Planet, okay, that they had in the movie house, and it was in color, Technicolor. So he started talking about with his friends about, we're going to see some coloreds today, colored people. And I was thinking, wow, like rainbows or something, I'm imagining. I have no idea what they were talking about until we were going down the, to the beach and they had a big sign up, no coloreds. And I'm thinking, why can't you have any color on the beach? I don't get it. This is 1940s and it was so bad that people took it for granted and it was all right. But still, little kids, they don't get this. They don't really see that because they start out innocent. We mentioned that last night, that when children are born, they're in a state of innocence, not a state of guilt, you know. And so they don't perceive this, this horrible thing. In Arabic, you've got something that extends over into tribalism and, and bipartisanism. It's called asabiyya. And this is... Worse than that. It's something horrible. And so we were now making a migration from up north to Texas. I remember that. And on the way, we stopped in a place called Arkansas. When we stopped in the gas station, my dad told the kids, said, go back there, you guys use the bathroom, come on, and we're going to go. You know how it would be. Well, my, my sisters got the ladies, but girls, you know, and somebody else had the men's, and I kept going, and that said, colored. I said, yeah, colored. That's going to be great, you know. I wanted to see what a colored bathroom looked like inside. <laughs> I could imagine that was going to be something. And when I come out of it, I said, ah, not that great of a bathroom, you know. <laughs> and some guy saw me come and said, what did you go in there for? I didn't want to tell him, you know. <laughs> I used the bathroom. He said, no, that's for colored. I didn't get it. But even though we've been through a lot in our country and we've seen busing, taking the black children to the white areas, white children to the black areas, they spent all of our Social Security money to do it. All the reserve for Social Security, they used it up for that. In the 60s, it got really bad, and then it got to the point where we had some very serious violence. And when Martin Luther King, Jr., was given a speech, he said that he had a dream, and his dream was to see the children all together, growing up together, going to school together. That was a dream that he had, and he said that. Right after that, they assassinated him. They killed him. This is the kind of hatred that comes with that. For what? For the color of his skin? Can you imagine that? And you might think that that's all over with. We don't have that problem. No. What it does, it just goes deeper. It hides its head down low, you know, under the radar. But it's still there. If you doubt what I said, and it extends beyond just the white-black thing, it's also a man-woman thing. You know, in the West, they still have a problem with women holding high position. You believe that? How come Hillary Clinton is out of the race? Hmm? Because... And we'll watch what happens now with Obama when he goes up against McCain. McCain is what? What color? Real white. <laughs> we'll see. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. We'll see. The point that I'm trying to get at really is how much the West really needs to understand 
what the true Islam is about because it's the thing that they claim to be looking for, the, the claim that they're making when they make their big speeches and pontificate ad infinitum on their great and wonderful <laughs> principles that they'd like to offer to the people of the ignorant, you know, backward third world countries. A white girl who is a Christian in Colorado was talking with friends and got the notion that she needed to go save the Muslims and others of Africa. She joined some peace group, whatever it was, and went traipsing all the way over to Africa. And she's out here, you know, going from place to place, thinking she's going to save these people. And she had a good, she had a good heart, don't get me wrong, I'm not making fun of her, just that this is the notion that she had. True, they were poor, so poor the people lived in grass huts. They were literally making their houses, and what they lived in, from whatever was available around them, palm trees and grass huts, things like this. But when she visited the village, the people would treat it like it was a festival. And she thought because, oh, I'm American, I'm going to give them civilization here, I'm going to, you know, save them and everything. And this is why they're holding this big celebration when I come. And they, there was food, a lot of food, more than she could eat. And the people would say, no, no, take more, take more, have more food, have more food. Oh, so she goes to the next village. Again, all the food is everywhere. They just say, eat, eat, come on, go out, eat. Oh, we've got cucumbers, tomatoes, whatever, eat. Along the way, she was at one of the villages and the people, and she said, I cannot eat anymore. And she said, I, I thought you guys were like poor over here. She said, we are. Our children are starving. She said, well, was all this food everywhere I go? There's plenty of food. The guide that she had said, ma'am, it's because you're here. They're Muslims and they're taking everything they have for the whole village because you're the guest. Because this is Islam. It doesn't matter our condition, our guests are first. She started crying. She said, I didn't come over here to hurt these people. I thought I could help them. And after she did a little soul searching, she realized that they actually had more than she did because she did not have the capacity to do what they were doing, to actually take food out of their own children's mouths. They were going from house to house. Do you have anything at all? I have a cucumber. Okay, have you got anything? I have half a tomato. Give it to us. What do you have over here? Okay. Oh, hey, a piece of bread. And they literally were taking everything they had just so she would not feel uncomfortable and insisting that she eat it. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But there are a lot of people in the world today who don't have a clue about that. They don't understand that. By the way, this lady made shahada, put on hijab, and went back to Colorado telling the people about Islam. Of course, they came up with this typical, for whoever goes to Islam, they've always got something to say about it. And in her case, Probably she got malaria or something. She's been crazy ever since. <laughs> when Cassius Clay, back, was it 50 years ago, 40 years ago? And he was a boxer. He was number one on top. And everybody's looking, Cassius Clay. Wow, who is this guy? Amazing. He accepted Islam and changed his name to Muhammad Ali. You know what they said right away? Too many shots to the head. <laughs> That'll do it. Drive you nuts. Went right off. There was a jazz singer that Elton John was so jealous of. He was glad when he became a Muslim and he said, I never had any competition after he got out of the business. Who was he talking about? Cat Stevens. Cat Stevens. I think he was Greek Orthodox or something, I don't remember, but he was Christian, at least by name. 
But when he entered Islam, all the people that used to love it, oh, because he's, he's got a great voice. Even today, he's got a good voice. And very creative with his music. But as soon as he became Muslim, you know what they said? Because he had been in the hospital. Too many drugs. Look at that. And by the way, it was TV, not drugs he was in there for. But this is the kind of thing that people will say. And it means that they have to try to explain. Why do you have to explain? If somebody decided, for instance, they don't want to be a Republican, they want to be a Democrat, that's in my country, why do you have to explain something? Why can't it be? That's just a choice. Why does it have to make an excuse? And they do. You should hear some of the things that people said, even about me and my family, when we came to Islam. It was a lot harder, though. They had to work really hard to come up with something because, hey, everybody knew us. Everybody knew what we were all about. My dad started the Concerned Christian Centers. And he always had donated and worked to build things and gave, never took anything. So you couldn't even twist it around. To, well, they're trying to use this as a front for their business, like some Christians do. We didn't do that. Each time somebody goes to Islam, you will see there's going to be resistance. There's going to be heavy resistance. When I came to Islam, I got into Islam, and <laughs> some of my relatives were telling me, oh, stay away from those Muslims. And when I would explain, because that was the one that really called my family to Christianity to start with, okay? So when I go to Islam and I came back to them, now they were like, whoa, you know, we can't listen to you anymore. I said, well, I found the next step up. Come on, look. Something happened. A very bad experience happened with some Muslims. They did something really bad. Which, in fact, I never tell the story because it's that bad. Still, it was only a couple and it was certainly not representative of Islam, it was some bad people. That's all. And again, they come to me, right? See, see, we told you, we told you, now come on back and be with us. I said, for what? I came in Islam, not for you, not for them. I came in Islam because it's the only thing that makes any sense. Islam is the only Thing that offers proof for everything it says. And there's nothing illogical about one staying one. One stays one. Hello? What's the problem? You don't have to go through this big contortion of, well, you see three and one, and the Trinity is, and the way that, uh, uh, you, uh, I just have faith. You don't have to do that. And I like that. One equals one. End of story. No more explanation after that. And as far as Jesus being God, Son of God, part of God, what's the nature of Jesus? Simple, he was a human being, but he was a miracle creation of a human being, just like Adam and Eve. Next question. And so, when something like this happens and somebody comes into Islam, should it be that they've got a real easy road? should be real easy, yeah? Because if you go to the right way, why would it be difficult? It should be real simple. If you use that logic, then what happens is it should be then that all Muslims are in good shape all the time. It should be that, according to that logic, Muslims would never have any hard time. That would always be in a good way. Make sense? One of the places that I'm supposed to go speak coming up uh, in July, sent me something, I read it yesterday, and one of the speeches, they, they like the name of the speeches, these are guys that do a speech, one, I mean a, a conference maybe once in their whole life, they put it together, they bring speakers in, they just give you a title or something. I remember one time they said, uh, coming to Islam, what can I do with that? And I said, that's the name of the speech? Well, I said, what can I do with that? And in this case, they wanted me to talk about the happy prophets. You know? Prophets, the happy people, something like this. And I looked at that and I went, what? 
I mean, this, what did you say, is like a cartoon? Yeah, it sounded like a cartoon show. Okay, the happy prophets are coming on, you know. <laughs> Content, yeah, content. That's what we decided today is a better word. That Allah talks about believers. Rabbi Allahu an or rather an. The the people are pleased with Allah and Allah He's pleased with them. Pleased or content, but not happy. I don't mean that you can't be happy and be a Muslim, but what I'm saying is that prophets especially are going to be the ones who are going to suffer the most. And this is because why? They're getting a huge reward for what they're doing. And Allah tells us in the Quran, it's in chapter 29, the ankle boot or spider, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim, A'hasa bin nas an yutruku an yakhulu amana. Do human beings think they're going to be left alone because they said we believe? And they won't put into yuftanun, which is from fitna. It means big trial, calamity, difficulty. Squeeze you, you know. Because, Allah continues, he did the same thing to the people before you to show who are the truthful and who are the liars. Because if you're really true, you believe in Allah. And you want to do something about it. Okay, go ahead and try. And you might say, well, why? Why would that be a difficulty? Part of that is to understand what the real purpose of life is. Part of that is to understand who your creator really is. To understand that would be then to understand your role in all of this. And then you would find out what you're supposed to be doing. And there's where the rub comes. Not rub in Arabic, rub in English. The rub. The problem that you're going to have is that you would soon realize that you can't do what you want to do. That we're here to do what he wants us to do. And if we understood that, then there are a lot of things we'd have to give up. You narrow your options down to be a real Muslim. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They don't want to give up their desires, their lusts, their personal goals. And that's where the problem comes. So if somebody's attacking you as a Muslim, if somebody's even attacking Islam in front of you, realize that it's not, it's not really you, it's not us as a whole. The problem is that they're responding to something that's coming to them that they don't want to accept. They don't want to accept it. Because it would mean they'd have to give up all the stuff they're doing. You follow me? That's the problem. In the West, for the most part, not everybody. By the way, it's, not, it's wrong to sum up and say everybody's like this, isn't it? Isn't that wrong? You don't like if somebody said that about us, right? No, we're human beings. We have different ideas, hopes and goals. True. For the most part, Muslims are good. We would say that. And for the most part, the Muslims are following Islam and doing a pretty darn good job. But there are some stinkers out there. True. And in the same case, when you look to the West, it's wrong to say all oh, the West is like this. Because they're not. There are also good people there. And they're also human beings, and they have goals, they have desires, they have things they're trying to do as well. And there are some, actually, who are lurking, looking, searching, trying to find the truth, and they would love to know some of the things that you take for granted every day. It would probably be, and I'm not really... Uh, I'm pretty sure that I'm right when I say this. That many of the people of the West would love to hear about it until they found out it was Islam. Simply because of the preconceived notion of Islam and Muslims. That if they knew how beautiful is this deen, this way, and how it solves so many of the problems that they have, they would be very happy with it. 
So by now, I think we should give you some examples of that. I've made my statement, so really, if I quit now, that was it. That's all I wanted to tell you, but I would like to give you some examples of that. One example is when I hear people, I'm going to show you something, how is the reverse of everything. This is just like, almost like turning a subject upside down and looking at it again. Somebody comes to us and attacks us. I, I mentioned that last night. And they say, oh, what a dumb thing. Look at, look at, ah, you're so backward. How? What's this thing about right hand, left hand thing? What is that all about? Come on, man. You know, because we shake hands with this. We don't want somebody to give us a left hand, do we? No. This is very bad. Somebody hand you the left hand. <sighs> he better be crippled in the other hand. <laughs> because that's wrong. Isn't it? What I, what I use this hand for? Besides shaking hands, what I use it for? Eating. eating. This is for eating. Do I eat with this hand? <laughs> How about... How do, how do we eat? Imagine sitting with somebody and he's going to put his left hand out there. Hey, 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 hey. What's that? Why? Oh, because you're backward. You don't even know your left hand from your right. Ha, ha, ha. Even I heard one recently say that they wanted to take this apart and said, how are you going to deal in a sociably acceptable environment? I like the way they put this, right? And eat in a decent restaurant with utensils. You know, it sounds like you're talking to a primitive caveman, right? <laughs> because when you cut your meat, don't you pick up the knife with this hand? Yeah. And you pick up the fork with this hand? Yeah. You cut the meat. Huh? Now, what's wrong with you? Can't you just put that in your mouth? What's the matter with you? We don't eat with the left hand. Oh, that's so backward. Even that. Now check this out. There's a reason we do this, because this hand, we keep it clean, because this hand we use to clean ourselves after the toilet. Oh, oh, how backward. Don't you use paper? <laughs> The United States Navy did a study. They had, this is a pretty cool way to do it too, because in the Navy you got people out on a boat, they can't get in touch with other people out there. And what they did, they had people washing their hands before and after their meals. On another ship, they ran the same test and had these guys not wash their hands before and after the meals to see what would happen. Totally and completely, no doubt about it, the ones washing hands before and after had the least amount of sicknesses being passed around. Of course, we know that real well nowadays because of what's happened with the studies that they've done and how many times people are getting this hepatitis, it's called hepatitis B, I think, that they're getting from the, these fast food places where they go in and the, the guy works there and go to the bathroom and come back, he doesn't wash his hands. Next thing you know, there's an outbreak of this all over the whole city. Everybody that ate there got it. So now they have these signs up there, you know, all employees must wash hands, things like that. Another time, a woman who worked for an insurance company, independent study, went out to a big corporation. They had so many employees taking off time, being sick, being ill. And so they asked her to come in and do a study. She went on every floor of the building and all their sub-buildings, everything around there, and, and did uh, tests, laboratory tests. And they would put this material, I saw the video on it, and she was putting this stuff, I don't know, it was like a dust or powder or something, on the telephones, on the keyboards, on this kind of thing, and then she would come back and collect it all up later. And they did studies, and they found fecal matter on the telephones and on the keyboards and on the fax machines and all the rest of it, along with other germs as well. Because people weren't taking care to wash themselves after going to the toilet. 
So again, they are insisting employees wash hands, and it makes a huge difference. You wouldn't believe there was going to be such a difference over that. Now, how does this work into the left hand, right hand thing? How does that come in? Well, I've got to stay on this subject a little bit more to get to it for you. If you want to talk about the toilet paper thing, okay, now I'm going to ask you. And I as a, now you guys, most of you don't have a dog, but in the West, everybody's got a dog. You know? And ask them, if you went out to pick up the paper in the morning, the newspaper, you're going to pick it up, okay? The boy threw it in the grass, you go pick it up. You put your hand down and you go, oh, man, somebody walked the dog right by here. Look at this. Huh? You got it on you. So what are you going to do? You're going to tear the newspaper and wipe that off, or you're going to go over to the hose and wash it off? Which one? So for the dog, you're washing, but for you, you're using paper. Ah, now you're getting a clue. You're starting to get a clue. Because what happens when a person washes themselves, and this is what Muslims actually are doing with the left hand, they, they're using water and totally washing themselves like if you were going to go to the bathtub or something. And the difference is tremendous. Because after this, washing the hands and all, this hand is really a lot cleaner than you think. Now I'm going to take you back a thousand years. The big scientists, doctors, and scholars of the time were in Andalus, Andalusia, in Spain. And these people were Muslims, and they were using the principles taught by Muhammad, Islam, 400 years before them, and they were analyzing these things, talking about being very philosophical about these things. People like Ibn Sina and uh, Rushd and other people like this that uh, are still today mentioned in the medical books, history books. You'll find that they were coming up with some very amazing things for them at their time. So much so that by the time of the Black Plague in Europe, which we'll call the West of those days, the people there were dying like flies. So fast they couldn't bury them, they were throwing them on wagons, dead bodies on wagons. And it was so bad that people were everywhere finding these diseases, this something was killing them. They call it the Black Death or Black Plague. You can read about it, go get the encyclopedia, and read about it. But these same people used to send their children to be educated in Spain because that's where the real higher, higher learning was. They sent them to Spain. But they found something amazing, even though some of the students came down with these diseases. It was only the students that came from Europe, but none of the locals got it. Why? And they came to know that it was because of this, this cleaning this hand and only eating with this hand and this hand only for anything dirty and still washing it anyway. The difference was that they were able to go back and solve the problem in Europe and that was the end of the Black Plague after they understood it. By the way, you won't find that in the common history books anymore today. There's no reason to mention that, is it? Especially because it has a connection to Islam. I'm going to share you with a, another one with you. Think about this. I was coming home one night from a program. It was very late at night, driving, back when my wife would let me drive. And I put my head down on the steering wheel at a red light, and I was so tired I couldn't lift my head back up. My little daughter was with me, and she's saying, Daddy, wake up. Daddy, wake up. I said, I can't. I'm exhausted. I'm going to pull over and stop. And she reached over and turned the radio on real loud. And I like to listen to talk shows, yeah? And the first thing come out, it was the beginning of the sentence. A man's voice said, always sit down when you eat or drink. I went, huh? He said, never stand up when you eat or drink. I'm going, Jamat Tablik is in town? <laughs> what is this? What's this guy talking about? You know, in Jamaat Tablik, they always tell you that, don't they? Sit down when you eat or drink. This is Sunnah Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You sit, you know, when you eat or drink. You don't stand up. And I'm thinking, what's this? He began explaining the damage that's caused starting at the neck 
and going all the way down, and he described all the kinds of problems from the hyalurnia to the pulling and tearing here in this part in the stomach and all of the operations that could be avoided if people would just sit while they eat or drink. I mean, I was wide awake. I drove all the way home listening to that. But now you've got a problem. Because now if you realized what he said and understood all of the damage done to your body by standing up, so now you're going to sit down when you eat or drink. Are you doing it for Islam, for Allah, or are you doing it for your health? Make sense? 1,400 years ago, somebody giving you advice. You make fun of it until you find, oh, oh, it really works? Yeah, he was probably having a lucky guess. Huh? It surprises me that the Muslims don't pick up on this faster. I've seen people who were not Muslim see things happen and then come to Islam. Here's another example. I used to be in a wholesale bag business, plastic bags to a distributor, and I would go around different places and set up dealers. And I happened to be waiting for a person to get done with a customer in a store once. He had a vitamin store, health food store, things like that, and I'm just walking around looking, and what has he got going here? And he had some, something there in the toothpaste department, health toothpaste of some kind. And the claim on this toothpaste thing says that it's the only substance on earth that can remove plaque and tartar from your teeth without damaging the enamel. It improves the gums and even cleans the tongue and all the way down into your stomach. And it mentioned the ingredient, some technical name that I still can't pronounce, but it said it comes from Siwak. Huh? From what? Miswack. Yeah? And it showed a stick on there, and it was trimmed back. And I saw it. I said, that's a miswack stick. And I turned it over. Dr. Muhammad's toothpaste. $4.75 for this little, little small. Huh? And you still have to go buy a toothbrush. Or, if you use the real miswack, instead of getting one or two percent, I think that's what it said was on there, you get a hundred percent and use the tooth stick that the Prophet used. And I've heard people today say, oh, you know, that's so tacky. You carry a stick with you? Oh. <laughs> oh. But when you see, and even today, you see any of the brothers who use it regularly, what do their teeth look like? Huh? Light bulbs. When they go, and you go, whoa, whoa, wow. Uh, am I right or wrong? It's amazing, isn't it? But now, oh, let's go back to the guy cutting his steak. Huh? Go back and read Emily Post. Do you know who's Emily Post? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Go back and check the people who tell you about proper manners. The proper manners is, yes, you pick up the knife with the right hand, you pick up the fork with the left, you cut the steak, and then you lay the knife down, and you pick the fork up with the right, and you eat it with the right. So it always was the same anyway. Because this goes all the way back to Europe at a time when they were getting over that problem of the Black Plague. Hello? So... Often, we're taking criticism from ignorant people and then adding more ignorance on top of it and rejecting what's really intelligence. I'm saying not only the West needs Islam, I'm saying Muslims need Islam. Yes or no? Yeah. Uh, we deviated far away, far away from the real Islam. It's not just in the eating and the health and taking care of our bodies, but it's also in the way we treat each other. 
And that's much worse. It's a more important aspect of Islam is treatment of others. Because after your correct relationship with your Lord, the very next important thing is your correct relationship with the people. And if it sucks, then what are you all about? How are you a good Muslim and nobody likes you? How? How does that work? At the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even his enemies had respect for him. Some of his enemies had respect for him. Yes or no? And when I find Muslims who don't have respect even for their own scholars and teachers, I'm wondering what's going on? What is this? Where's the proper behavior? One of the things that happens is the boob tube. But you start watching that thing and you watch these scenarios that they fabricate and put on there and you start thinking that's how people really are. And one of the things that we notice more than anything else is the bad treatment given to parents in most of these programs. And that's not new. That didn't just happen last week. That's been going on since the 1930s before there was television. All the way back to the time of Dagwood Bumstead, Dagwood and Blondie, they always showed him, the father of the house, the leader of the family, as a real dim bulb, a real yo-yo, a schmuck. They did. And it was funny. Everybody would make fun of that. And then they had programs about it. And they had the little kid is always the smart one, Dennis the Menace. The kid is always the brilliant one, the parents are stupid, the kid's real sharp, and he's putting them down to the extent today that they just start right out. The very first joke they got is the kid going, Eh, hey, what a yo-yo. And everybody's ah, 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 laughing. <coughs> Judaism, Christianity, and Islam forbid that. They forbid that. In fact, it's an order in all three of the monotheistic religions that the parents are so high, so high that they're mentioned in the commandments in this priority. After God, Almighty Allah, worship Him alone and keeping religion pure for Him and staying away from false worship and worshiping according to His rules, that's the first four commandments. Number five in the commandments is how you treat your parents. It comes before number six, which is don't kill. It's exactly the same order in the Quran, no difference. So regardless of what your take is on which religion, on which book, I think all of us need to go back and look and think, what are we doing? How could we possibly treat our elders as we do today? How could we even make jokes? It's not acceptable to put down your mother, to put down your father. To talk about your elders, your teachers, regardless of their religious affiliation, regardless of their political minds, they're your parents, and you have to give them that dignity. Am I wrong or right? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. They wanted me to talk about how the West needs Islam. I'm saying all of us need it. I'm saying that it's not something that's like an obscure thing for one area here or there. I'm saying if you're a human being, how can you live without Islam? How? And most people on the earth have some points of Islam in their life and they don't know it. Is that true or false? It's true. Think about it. If somebody is willing to put the other person ahead of their needs. Is that a teaching in Islam? Yes. If somebody is willing to sacrifice from themselves to help somebody else, is this Islam? Yes. If somebody is going to feed somebody in the day of need, or take care of the orphan, or the traveler, the wayfarer, is that part of Islam? Yes. It may be that they don't have the right beliefs, but how about the actions? And when we find that there are so many people who want to do something good, they have an idea. How about this? Instead of cutting them down to the level of, okay, because you don't believe what I believe, you're totally wrong. How about emphasizing the good that people do and encourage them to do more? Okay, you've got a good deed here. 
How about let's add to that? I mentioned something last night, but I'll mention it again, that sometimes we find people of other faiths who start hanging around the Muslims, and even to the extent that they, they like what they hear, they like what they see, they feel good when they're with you because you're a good Muslim, you don't drink alcohol, you don't smoke cigarettes, you don't play with drugs, you don't chase after women. And as long as these things are in place, especially you don't cut people down, you don't make somebody feel like low, they feel good. They want to be with you. To the extent that when you want to do salah, they want to pray. They want to stand and pray with you. When you're fasting, they want to fast with you. So you ask them, well, why don't you become a Muslim? What? No. No, 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 no. But they're still doing some good deeds, yeah? But we come back to this same thing again to remind them that as much as your good deeds that you're doing, how about this idea? How about enroll in the program to get the benefits? How about sign up huh, for the job so you can get paid on payday? Make sense? If you're going to do all this good stuff anyway, what is it to enter Islam? It is to say with conviction that there really is God. One God. And that you want to worship Him on His terms. That's the very beginning. That's the first step. Immediately followed by the second step. To bear witness that Muhammad brought the message that I just said. That there is one God. And you need to do what He wants you to do. What is so tough about this? For somebody who already claims to believe in the monotheistic faith. And the answer comes that people say, well, this is what I grew up in. This is what I found my forefathers doing. I'm committed to this because my family is this, my tradition is this, and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Quran. This is exactly the excuse that people use. But it's not a valid excuse. It is ignorance. Because if you know something will benefit you more than what you have, why can't you abandon that for what's better for you? Why not? And I'm going to wrap it up by telling you what happened to me. When I was trying to convert the Muslim to Christianity. When it comes to debating, I considered myself pretty good at it. I used to do it. I used to love to debate any subject. It didn't have to be about religion. What do you want to debate? I take either side. I enjoyed it. And he could tell I'm trying to convert him. And at one point he says, my religion, Islam, teaches me that if I find something better than what I have, I have to go for that. I said, what? He said, yeah. Whatever we have, if we find something better, we leave what we have and take what is better. I got him. I said, you mean to tell me that if you find a better religion, you'll go to it? He said, yeah, if there's a better religion, I'll go to it. <laughs> I got him. Because Christianity, you don't have to fast, what is it, 30 days in Ramadan? You don't have to pray five times a day. You don't have to go to Mecca. You don't have to do a pilgrimage. You don't have to pay something called zakat. In fact, you don't even have to be nice to be a Christian. You should, but it's not a mandate. The mandate is to say Jesus died for your sins. That's the big thing. And he's the son of God. That's easy. And when I said that to him, he said, well... I will go to your religion if your religion is better than mine. But you need proof. Proof? Uh, excuse me. Religion is not about proof. Religion is about faith. He said in Islam we have both faith and proof. I said, do you mean to sit there and tell me as a Muslim... You can prove there's God. 
He said, you mean to sit there and tell me as a preacher? You can't? Uh, what was the question? <laughs> now I'm curious. I got to know. I got to know. What is the proof that there is God? Because actually I'd want to know that all my life. I know there's God, but I don't have any proof. I just know it. But how? I, I, I can't imagine a time when I didn't believe there was God. Really. I remember back in the 1960s, mid-60s, about the time of the motorcycle gangs that were going over to the hippie thing with the flower children and all that stuff. Life magazine came out with a special edition, and on the front of it said, God is dead. And I went, oh, huh? Can you imagine a grown-up doing that? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a real gopher, you know. I said, oh, God, what happened? Where's the obituary pages in this thing? And it was some kind of nonsense article, but it, it got my attention. This, uh, it, it's something that, you know, people speculate a lot of things about God, offer this and offer that, and they come up with some real weird ideas. But nobody ever talks about the proof that God exists. We have a website that you can go to and get a lot of evidence. It's called scienceislam.com. On it, we have videotape of nine different scientists, well known in their fields and in their particular disciplines. They studied what the Quran is saying about the way the earth is structured, the way the mountains are, about the, where milk comes from in a cow between a conjunction of the blood and the intestines, mentioning about the bees, mentioning details about how the human embryo is formed, how it grows, the trimesters, so many things that they studied. And remember, these are not Muslims. In fact, they're atheists. But it, each one of them at the end of the video said, what I found from this seminar or convention that they were having, and from, there was about the Quran, it, it, there's no way 1,400 years ago somebody said these things. Couldn't have been. Could not have been. And some of them said, well, it must be from Allah. And one of them, standing while he was giving his talk, two and a half minutes into it, he said, I guess it's time for me to say, Ashadu la ilaha illallah, Ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. This came out in the 1980s. And by the late 1990s, it became a popular notion amongst a lot of the scientists not a majority, but a lot of them around the world, that they need to go back and re-look and reinvestigate a lot of the things they've been saying. And some of them came up with the idea, they didn't want to say there's God, but they did come with a new thing. I don't know if you heard about it. ID. Intelligent design. They're saying there's some intelligence behind the design, but they don't want to go further than that. They don't want to lose their fellowship, or they don't want to lose their you know, positions that they have with different universities, because you can get cut off at the knees real quick. Just intelligent design. What I'm saying, though, is proof. Proof. If you want to know about proof, some things could be right in front of your face. And we used to say you can't see the forest because the trees are in the way. And that's the way a lot of us are. Yeah. The West needs Islam, but I'm telling you, all of us need Islam. But we need to understand what Islam really is. So let's put a cap on it with this. The word Islam is coming from a verb, aslama, and it carries these five things. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. That if a person will really surrender to God, and really submit to his commandments and then obey those commandments in sincerity, then be at peace with whatever comes, then he'll be in Islam, and in Arabic he'd be a Mu Islam, Muslim. It's as simple as that. It's not that complicated. And by the way, as I mentioned earlier in the program, about these prophets, in fact they are at peace. They are at peace with whatever comes to them. 
A true Muslim is content with what Allah gives them. And he's also content with what he doesn't get as well. We should be happy that we don't get cancer, tuberculosis, broken legs. We should be happy that we don't get robbed. But at the same time, we should be happy that we don't get a lot of money because maybe it would corrupt us. Maybe it would cause bigger problems for us. Maybe people would rob us then. Maybe somebody would get killed over huge amounts of money. Maybe, 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 but the point is, Allah knows best, and He gave you what He wants you to have. What's your problem? What is your problem? So the Prophet ﷺ said, what translates to English, the condition of a true believer is amazing because only good comes to them. That when the material things come, the things that they want, whatever it might be, they say, shukr Allah, thank you to Allah. They appreciate it. And when the difficulties, the trials and tribulations come to them, they make sabr. They're at peace with it. Persevering and patient. And he said, and it's good for them, but it's only in the case of the believer. So may Allah make it good for us and make us believers. I mean, Allah guide us, and keep us in the real deen and help the people of the East, the West, the Middle East and everything in between to understand and put into practice the good of Islam. I mean, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.